few lines concerning this is a, a, a summary, a reduced version of the. You go to Wikipedia and you find such a position. You go to the, your official site at uh, Zurich and you find, and I, I compared the two biographies. And, uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, let's be serious. Alexander Sasha Puzin was born some time ago in Russia. Uh, he studied structural engineering, and this is something that I think it would be interesting to, to know, at Moscow Institute of Civil Engineering, and he graduated some time ago. <laughs> then after, uh, he moved to Israel, and, uh, and it is in Israel that he got his PhD in geotechnical engineering. So he started structural, then degraded to geotechnical, and that was in 97, 1997. From the Technion, uh, Samuel Friedman, who was his uh, supervisor, and he was working on the behavior of soft clays under irregular cyclic loading. You did. We all ha we all have problems in our past, you know. <laughs> anyway, after this, after this, he was he became a lecturer in uh, Technion, lecturer, then senior lecturer and then tenured associate professor, and, uh, and then he moved again from uh, Israel to the States, one mistake after the other, <laughs> 2002, 2004. So for a couple of years, he was in Georgia Tech, US, where he was associate professor uh, at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And then in 2004, another change the last one, perhaps. But every time they increase my salary, I can explain. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now you start understanding the, the, driving, the driving force here. So in 2004, he became full professor of geotechnical engineering at ETH Zurich. Now, I should tell you that if I'm not wrong, we, the two of us, we met for the first time in 1999 in Horton. Mm -hmm. Thanks to Dimitri Kolibas. I was with Claudio Taremini and I remember that we met him together. We were discussing about hypoplasticity. <laughs> and he saw these two guys discussing hypoplasticity. You came to us and said, how beautiful it is. Of course you were lying, but how beautiful it is to people discussing hypoplasticity. Now I can tell that it's a pleasure to discuss thermodynamics and other things with uh, Sasha. But from time to time, for those of you who know him, he also discusses about other items than hypoplasticity and thermodynamics. Another personal law that I think is interesting is that it was in Lyon in 2003 that Sasha introduced me to Itai Einar hmm, by saying, this is a former student of mine because he had got his PhD with Sasha in 2002. Now, it's really, and I don't want to, to, to become boring, uh, to tell the number of things of uh, research interests, of accomplishment. Uh, I, mean, I, I think that you will discover by yourself uh, what are the things that uh, Sasha is interested in, what are the things that Sasha is uh, good at. Uh, just perhaps, uh, because I think this is fair, uh, mention the fact that this is not the first prize that he gets. Of course, it's the most important, huh? but it is not the first that he gets. He was particularly uh, loved by the British for some reason. <laughs> not salary, I guess. Anyway, uh, uh, the British gave him two geotechnical research medals, hmm. 2004 and 2013. Then he got the George Stephenson medal in 2013. David Hillslop, I, I thought it was Bishop and United, <laughs> Hillslop in 2018. And then I think this is also very important to mention, uh, Sasha was uh, the editor of the international journal Geotechnique, that is a journal many of you, many of us know. And I think that he has a, had an important role uh, in those years Thank by leading. Uh, at some point he stopped because... Uh, they the they kicked me out. <laughs> 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 Okay, and then, etc. Yeah, one last thing, the very last. He was a recipient of the ETH Zurich Excellent in Teaching Award in 2009 and 2013. So, a, as you see, there is many, there are many, many things uh, characterizing this uh, invited lecture. 
And uh, one very last thing that I want to say is that uh, technically speaking, we are doing something that is not really uh, compelling to the rules of the, of the community, of, the, of Alert, because the invited speaker, by definition, is somebody who doesn't belong to the Alert. Now, it turns out that Zurich is a member of Alert. But this is the first time that Sasha comes here. So I think that he is. <laughs> <laughs> Don't come and you get a prize, I mean. Uh, that, that's the <laughs> message. Not coming. It's month enough that you got the message. So <laughs> we'll be happy to welcome you next year and in two years, etc. But for now, we'll be happy to listen to your talk. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Okay, how do I get out of here? Pass to the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now... Mm -hmm. We are getting there. Okay, the first test passed. No? <laughs> okay, now I need some, uh, somebody crashed computer. Dorian? Show that you deserve the prize. Anyway, my friends, can you hear me? I'm sorry I sound a little bit like um, Chino today with this rough voice. <laughs> but this is because my son started the kindergarten and we are all permanently sick now. <laughs> uh, Chino, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And uh, thank you, Dorian. Um, it is really a great honor for me to be here today. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm going to talk today about the growth of sleep surfaces and how it affected my life. We are going to have an epilogue, four episodes, and the finale. <laughs> and I'm going to start with the neurosurgery. In 2002, when I moved to Georgia Tech, my main concern was how to get research funding. And there was not much funding available in geomechanics. So I switched to biomedical research. And I was lucky. I managed to get two grants from the National Institute of Health, one on augmentation of accuracy of the image-guided neurosurgery, and another on image-guided constitutive modeling of human brain. It appeared that human brain behaves very much like Saturated clay, <laughs> mechanically, of course. But I was not the first geotechnical engineer who noticed this analogy. Malcolm Bolton from Cambridge and his PhD student published a paper a couple of years before me. So I asked Malcolm why didn't they continue, and he told me a shocking story. His PhD student got a brain tumor during his studies. But Malcolm said, that he got lucky because they had a neurosurgeon on their research team who personally operated on him. Um, and he was okay. I also had a neurosurgeon on my research team, but my understanding of luck was probably a little bit different. Therefore, not surprisingly, that when in 2004 I moved to ETH and my main problem became how to spend research funding. <laughs> I decided that I'm going to do something less dangerous and moved back into geomechanics. <laughs> Episode one, growth of sleep surfaces. Actually, I started working on this problem when I was still at Georgia Tech. Since my PhD in Israel, I was fascinated 
by enormous dimensions of submarine landslides. And I was never convinced that they could fail simultaneously over tens of kilometers. I discussed this problem with my fracture mechanics colleague from Georgia Tech, Leonid Germanovich, and he was confident that slip surfaces appear in a relatively small uh, weak um, zone, and then they grow over tens of kilometers, like cracks. But I said, Leonid, slip surfaces in soils, they are not cracks. We know that strain localizes and slip surfaces form in uh, strain softening soils, where shear strength drops from uh, peak to residual in the post failure regime. And sometimes, in some of our tests, under certain conditions, we can see how they grow. Like in these x ray images of a trap dot test, which I took from the PhD of Graf who was the student of Yanis Vardalakis. But then, in other tests, like laboratory element tests, sometimes it seems that they just appear simultaneously. Like in this image analysis of um, uh, a biaxial compression test kindly provided to me by China in 2002. Leonid Germanovich told me that there is no contradiction. It is all about stable versus unstable growth of the slip surfaces. If the growth is stable, it requires work of additional external forces. Therefore, you can control it and pause it to take images. If the growth is unstable, it takes place under existing external forces. It is much faster, and you cannot pause it. You can only detect it using high-speed camera. And it appeared later that he was right. So we decided to apply uh, the fracture mechanics principles oh, to slip surface growth in slopes. Also here, we were not the first people to do that. The most cited work was by Palmer and Rice, who did this 30 years before us for the uh, case of the cut in the slope. What we did, we solved the problem for a weak initial zone, which is more relevant for submarine landslides. So we used energy balance approach to find the criteria for unstable growth. Energy balance approach states that growth takes place when more energy is released in the sliding layer than dissipated in the shear band. And uh, the criterion for unstable growth is formulated in terms of the critical length of the initial zone. If the initial zone is larger than critical, it will propagate in unstable manner. This critical length depends on parameter delta bar, which is proportional to the area or energy dissipated below the softening curve. And this very important parameter r, which we call, or actually Rice called it, shear stress ratio. It relates driving force to residual and peak strength. Driving force is the gravitational shear stress, which is proportional to the inclination. <laughs> now, if R is larger than 1, driving force is larger than the peak strength, and the slope fails instantly without any growth of slip surfaces. If R is smaller than 0, then driving force is smaller than residual strength. And here, in order to propagate slip surface, you always need to push. So this is going to be the stable growth. Only in between 0 and 1, we are going to have unstable growth. This parameter r will appear again in this presentation, so have a good look at it. And then we wrote a paper which showed that a famous historical landslide, which is 150 kilometer long, could have initiated from a relatively short 2-3 kilometer initial zone. <laughs> and I even got uh, a positive feedback from two or three people who, who, for some reason, keep reading my papers. <laughs> but this time, I expected a little bit more than that. Because over many years, my secret dream was to penetrate offshore geotechnical mafia 
to be able to benefit like them from the generosity of oil companies. <laughs> but, but for the first seven years, nothing happened until in 2012, at one of the conferences, I got approached by a suspiciously looking man. <laughs> Episode two, the offshore mafia. <laughs> this man was Tom Gray, who works for the BP oil company, and who asked me if I can help them with a Zeri Caspian Sea project. The problem was that BP in the Caspian Sea ran out of the good places to put their platform. Now they had to go into the area where they had traces of enormous historic landslides. And this is not surprising because Caspian Sea has all possible triggers you want for a landslide. Seismicity, anticline uplift, sedimentation, sea level uh, change, excess pore water pressure, everything. Uh, geomorphologists identified several families of the landslides. Slab slides with limited displacements, with run out at the bottom, with plowing at the bottom, and with the spreading at the top. But the problem was, was when they used conventional approaches like limiting equilibrium to explain sizes of these landslides. They couldn't explain it. It was always only the steepest slopes that failed for available triggers. And that's where BP thought maybe I can help them with the sleep uh, surface growth approach. But Geotech Mafia was not going to make it easy for me. <laughs> Especially this gentleman, Dr. Mark Lee, who is a geomorphologist. <laughs> so the challenges, they were challenging us to validate our approach experimentally and numerically and both for stable and unstable growth of sleep surfaces. For this purpose, we built a chute at ETH, two meter long, uh, 25 centimeters wide, consolidated four centimeters of kaolinite clay in it, inclined it by 10 degrees, and applied the force on the top of the slope using this miniature bulldozer. We solved this problem analytically using energy balance approach and also numerically using abacus with the modified softening interface between the clay and the steel. And uh, as you move your bulldozer to the left, you can see via propagation of the shear stress field that indeed something is growing here at the bottom to the left, a slip surface. To be able to model these tests, we need soil parameters. So we perform independent of the meter, ring shear, and most importantly, interface shear stresses. Sorry, shear tests, where we indeed saw that there is a softening both in normally consolidated and over consolidated test at um, uh, the interface between the clay and the steel of the chute. So now we could compare our prediction, analytical solid and numerical dashed, for the length of the slip surface versus the displacement of the bulldozer. And you can see that they're not that far from each other, but the best thing is that they're actually pretty close to these red dots, which are measured lengths. So how did we measure the lengths? Using uh, fiber optic, distributed fiber optic strain sensing. We put two cables into the sliding layer with the help of the miniature uh, uh, anchors. When the slip surface grows, the uh, sliding layer above it gets compressed. And by measuring compression strains, we could see where the diagram ends, and this was more or less the end of the slip surface. So with the accuracy of one centimeter, we could find it. Now, when the angle of inclination was 10 degrees, it was a stable growth because r was smaller than zero. And you can see that, the, that in order to grow the slip surface, these red dots, you constantly need to increase the force, the blue one. Okay? 
Our growth was pretty slow, three centimeter by, uh, per second, but this was actually controlled by the rate with which we applied the force. Okay? But then, when we increased the inclination to 15 degrees, R became larger than zero, and we can see that in the beginning, the force and the length, they grow together, but then, probably reaching a critical length, you have a very fast growth of the slip surface, in spite of the fact that the force in the bulldozer drops. So, indeed, it was a fast growth, fast unstable growth, with the velocity around 80 centimeters per second, and Abacus prediction produced something similar, 100 centimeters per second. So, um, after that, our peers ran out of arguments, and we were allowed to apply the approach to the Azeri project. The remaining challenges were that we had 2D slopes instead of the infinite slope. We had to incorporate seismic loading, excess pore water pressures, and seismic degradation of shear strength, but also post-failure geomorphology. This sounds complicated, but I will try to give a simple explanation. This approach can be explained in this one slide. So the primary failure takes place after an earthquake, for example, when the steeper part of the slope with R larger than 1 fails, and uh, we get the formation of the initial slip surface. If this portion is large enough, larger than critical, the slip surface will start grow in an unstable manner in the part of the slope with R larger than zero, causing the secondary failure. If the resulting uh, slab fails and start moving, we have significant unloading at the top and loading at the bottom, and under certain conditions, we can get now stable propagation of the excess, uh, sorry, of the uh, slip surface into the stable part of the slope with R smaller than zero. And this we call tertiary failure. And this tertiary failure takes place in form of spreading at the top and plowing at the bottom. But sometimes we just have a scarp at the top and run out at the bottom. Why? It depends, like we see here in this uh, abacus simulation, if the slip surface can propagate into the stable part of the slope. As you can see, for the next block to fail in active failure, the slip surface needs for us to propagate under it. Now, we used this knowledge in order to develop in the frame of the kinematic energy balance approach, uh, analytical criteria for plowing and spreading. And then we, can, we could use it to investigate analytically the entire dynamic landslide evolution. And you ask me, why analytically if we have seen that you can do this in Abacus? The problem was that BP did not just uh, want to investigate stability of one or two slopes. It wanted to investigate the stability of the entire basin with 200 square kilometers using GIS. And here you can see result of such investigation for a landslide with return period of 3,000 years. So this is a uh, red indicates here failure, a failed slope. And this is for uh, using conventional limiting equilibrium approach. And this is using the slip surface growth. You can see the difference is quite dramatic. Most importantly, it is confirmed by geomorphological evidence. And as a result, it helped BP to find a safe location for their future platform. But unfortunately, I'm not allowed to show you where it is. <laughs> Conclusions. If the steep portion of the slope is long enough, milder portions are also not safe. And second, it is nice to be one of the boys. <laughs> Unfortunately, this didn't last long, because in 2015, <laughs> oil prices collapsed and they kicked me out. <laughs> <laughs> and
And this would be the end of this sleep surface story. <laughs> but two years later, I received a mysterious phone call from engineering company in Zurich. Episode two, landslide influence zone. Let me just have a sip. Uh, the voice on the phone told me that they have a new project on Zurichberg and they may need my help. Zurichberg is a hill pretty close to the historic part of Zurich. ETH is here and their project was there. And the reason they needed my help is because of the old landslide. And I get really shocked because I do not know any landslide on Zurichberg. And if you think that I'm worried about ETH, you are wrong because my apartment is here. <laughs> and here I have a small garden where my visitors love to work when they come. So I go to geological maps and I find out that indeed in 1770 there was a huge landslide on Zurichberg. And my apartment is okay, <laughs> but my garden is not okay. And their project is just at the lower boundary of this landslide. But actually, what appeared that they meant a more recent landslide. In 1979, a smaller part of the slope collapsed, 45 by 75 meters, seven meters deep because of the excavation in this area, and the landslide stopped 12 meters just above their project. It caused quite a lot of damage to this building, 103, both outside and inside. And you are probably disappointed, you expected to see ruins, but trust me, it's not good to be inside when the house cracks. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, now they want to replace the old house, 71, uh, with the bigger new house, which is also going to be deeper because it has a parking garage. And they decided that they will support excavation for the earth pressure, which is 20% larger than the terrestrial coefficient, 0.6. But the neighbors still remember about that landslide. So they get scared. They hire a consulting, independent consulting company. Consultants look at this 0 0.6 and say, are you crazy? You know, you have a landslide above and you do it as if it is all flat. So designers say, how, OK, how much do you want? Consultants say, we do not know. It's your job. <laughs> so to make things worse, this house, 80, belongs to Professor Herbert Einstein from MIT, who is also a geotechnical engineer with the 50 years of experience. <laughs> so every time designers or uh, consultants, they have an idea and write a report, Professor Einstein totally destroys it. And he's right. So at this stage, construction is delayed. Lawyers are involved. They tell me you're our last hope. My intuition tells me, Sasha, don't get yourself into this mess. <laughs> but I don't listen. What I didn't know, that actually this same area 500 years ago was execution and burial place for the criminals in the city of Zurich. So I start investigating, and the first question that I ask why did the landslide stop here, just above this Restelbergstrasse? Uh, from uh, the investigation of 1979, they found out that soil rock interface here is about 15, 16 degrees. Site investigation for the new house gives soil rock interface at 10 degrees. So, okay, there is a sharp change in slope, and exactly where it changed, there, there is a failure. But the house, is only 12 meters away. So the question is, did it help to stop the slide? Or at least, does it have elevated pressures? So the question is, what is the pressure acting on the house? 
But before that, let us find out what is the pressure here in this failed part, a so-called landslide pressure. We can easily for, uh, calculate the pressures acting on uh, the wall, which is moves away from the slope. This is active pressures. When the wall moves towards the slope, these are passive pressures. But here it is the slope that moves towards the wall. And kinematic, as you can see here, is different. And the first person to recognize it was Professor Heffeli from ETH Zurich. In 1945, he solved this problem using rather arbitrary assumptions. Uh, and my students, 70 years later, decided to solve the same problem using limit analysis. And uh, for a particular case of uh, mm, slow parallel slip surface, you could, could even get an analytical solution. Here you can see how horizontal earth pressure coefficient depends on the slope angle. And you can compare this exact solution to Heffeli solution. And you can see that when the slope is steep, these are pretty close. But in our case of 15 degrees, Heffeli underestimates the exact solution quite considerably. Now, groundwater complicates things a lot. Uh, we could not find exact solution here. We only found lower bound and upper bound, but they appear to be pretty close. And the uh, important thing is that uh, the normalized total horizontal landslide force decreases if the groundwater level rises. Now, using this solution, we found out that for our Zurichberg problem, landslide pressure is 1.71. At the same time, we calculated how much can this house take. And it appears that it will be shared if the pressure will be 1. So somehow, the pressure has decreased here below 1. We need to find the mechanism of pressure reduction. And to do this, we need to answer the question, what happens to a naturally stable slope when it is loaded at the top? And we know what happens. It is a growth of the slip surface. This is exactly like in our bulldozer experiment. Important thing here, both in the experiment and on Zurichberg, is that there is no plowing due to higher strength of subaerial sediments. In submarine sediments, we also had plowing there. So now we can explain more or less the mechanism. First, the steeper part of the slope fails, the pressure at the bottom part increases, and we have a stable growth of the slip surface until the slope here fails. We know the landslide pressure, and using energy balance approach, we also know the pressure at the end of the slip surface. But this is not enough. What is the pressure downslope from the slip surface? And how do we find the pressure on the structure? Or if there is no structure, how far away from the landslide will the pressures return back to far field at rest pressures? Or what is the length of the landslide influence zone? So the challenges were here compared to submarine landslides, groundwater flow instead of the submerged slope, slip surface growth into the stable slope without plowing due to the higher strength of the sliding layer, and presence of the structure hindering downslope displacements. To implement these mechanisms, we use a different approach, a process zone approach, where you investigate stresses and strains, not only above the fully soft softened slip surface, but also within the partially softened process zone, and even in the elastic shearing zone. As I mentioned, water in structure complicates things here, but this did not prevent us from finding analytical solutions for pressures normalized by at rest pressure as a function of the normalized distance from the landslide. And for the slip surface, the pressures decrease downslope linearly, in the process zone, in the form of the cosine function, and in the elastic shearing zone exponentially. And we could also find the process zone length and the slip surface length. And you see that everything again became, be, mm, uh, depends on our parameter r, plus parameter beta, which is related to the stiffness of the weak layer where the slip surface grows. 
So let us look together now at the solution. In particular for the Zurich Bear case, where steep slope was 15 degrees, mild slope 10 degrees, groundwater was pretty high, solid lines are pressures without structures, um, dashed lines are pressures with structures, and we plot here normalized earth pressure versus distance from the landslide, normalized by the thickness of the sliding layer. So what do we see here? First of all, the length of the influence zone is about 5.5 thicknesses. In our case, it's about 40 meters. So the house is 12 on average 17 meters away. It is inside the landslide influence zone. Let us find the pressures. The pressures are a little bit below double at rest earth pressure coefficient, which means just below the maximum shear force that the structure can take. They really got lucky. Now, if, however, the structure was not there, the earth pressures would be even higher. I mean, this sounds like a paradox, right? If you prevent displacements, you should accumulate more stresses. But not in the case of the slip surfaces. Because with slip surfaces, larger displacements create more softening, and you need more force to keep equilibrium. Good conclusions. <coughs> be careful when digging into a mild slope below a landslide, even if it seems to be far away from it. And the power of mechanics. After I submitted my report, it was accepted within 24 hours by all parties, including Professor Einstein. The fight was over. The only person whom I uh, didn't manage to convince, and I will explain to you why, uh, I think what they actually convinced everybody else was the simple mechanics based on the laws of Newton leading to analytical solutions. It's very uh, difficult to argue with that. The only person whom I didn't manage to convince was my wife. <laughs> She's a lawyer, laws of Newton, she looked at them, there are no laws of Newton in, in, <laughs> in their textbooks, right? So she said, I do not care, I don't want to live close to the landslide, let us sell our garden, and instead buy a hut in the mountains on solid rock. <laughs> And this would probably be uh, the end of the sleep surface story. But half a year before these events, I was visited by another suspiciously looking man. <laughs> Episode four, delayed snow avalanches. Itai enough. Once a year he comes to Zurich and I buy him a huge dessert to compensate for all the nasty things I did to him when he was my PhD student. <laughs> but this time he was on a mission. A week before he came, he was skiing in French Alps and saw news of a tragic Riga Piana avalanche in Italy, which destroyed a hotel, killed 11 people, and injured 29. On the same day, there were a series of earthquakes with epicenter 40 kilometers away from the hotel. After finishing his holiday, Zetai went to Grenoble to, to meet Thierry Fau, who is an expert on avalanches from Erster, and asked him, is it possible that the avalanche was triggered by the earthquake? And Thierry said that he just gave an interview to French TV, and indeed there is a debate. But the problem is that on the same day, there was also a very strong snowstorm. The <coughs> earthquakes can, in fact, trigger avalanches. Uh, there is a documented evidence collected here by Podolsky for larger magnitudes and lower epicentral distances. There is also indirect evidence over here for smaller magnitudes. Rigabiana was somewhere in between, but the problem is that the last 
quake, which was 4.6, took place 40 minutes before the avalanche. Is this delay possible? It I knew that I was working on delayed landslides, and he asked if I can help. But the problem is that indeed, there was a strong earthquake on the same day, who could also trigger this avalanche. So Itai Thierry and myself, we started looking for other cases of earthquake triggered delayed avalanches only without a storm. And this was not easy. It took a lot of time, but thanks to our Indian colleagues, we managed to identify four cases in Western Himalaya reported by the Indian Army. Two cases, this white rose, they have two large delays and epicentral distances to believe in the real correlation. But to other cases, this gray rose, they actually had pretty similar delay to Rigapiano, very similar slopes, a reasonable epicentral distance, and very similar magnitudes. The good news was that they took place one and two days after the last snowstorm. Another curious thing are the slopes of all three avalanches, 31 and 33 in India and uh, 32 in um, Rigapiano. For soils, this would be pretty steep slopes, but for avalanche people, they are considered mild, because if you can look here at the cumulative di distribution of avalanches, depending on the slope angle, you can see with these slopes, probability of the avalanches is pretty small. But this is again for human triggered avalanches, not earthquake triggered avalanches. So we decided to investigate the case. We wanted to propose the mechanism of delay avalanche release, investigate plausibility of delays in Italy and India, and to answer the following questions. Why such mild slopes? Why only moderate earthquake magnitudes? And why are these events so rare? People who have nothing better to do can read our <laughs> recent paper in the Proceedings of the Royal Society. For the rest of you, I will, I'm going to take you quickly through this list. So let us start with the mechanism. After the earthquake, a slip surface, or in this case it is called basal shear fracture, forms in the weak layer in the snow slope. Uh, in this slip, on this slip surface, the shear strength drops to residual value, which becomes smaller than gravitational shear stress, so r is larger than zero, and then this unbalanced force loads the creeping snow mass below, causing time-dependent deformations. These time-dependent de deformations drive the process zone of the slip surface downslope into the weak layer. Okay? Now, the slip surface growth here is very slow. It is unstable because r is larger than zero and takes place at the existing forces, but it is very slow because the softening of the strength in the process zone is compensated by rate hardening of the strength in the intact weak layer. So this slow growth continues until rate hardening switches to rate softening. And this is, happens at a certain velocity. And this is a critical point, because after that, you cannot maintain equilibrium anymore and the slip surface starts propagating catastrophically, leading to the avalanche release. So challenges compared to landslides here were complicated rate hardening, softening, and self-healing mechanism, strong rate dependency of snow behavior, and strong dependency of snow properties on temperature, density, and time. The first one we treated by considering a very broad range of snow properties, the first two we incorporated, with simplifications of course, into constitutive models for the weak layer and the creeping snow mass, which are all time and rate dependent. Combining these constitutive relationships with the equilibrium of the creeping snow mass, 
we formulated three boundary value problems. One for stresses, which allowed us to find the critical length after which growth becomes catastrophic. Another in displacements, which allowed us to find another critical length below which the slip surface will not grow. If it is higher than uh, initial growth length, then you will get first a slow and then a fast growth. And finally, the third problem allowed us, this is a moving boundary problem, allowed us to find solution for this slow crack growth. And uh, here I have to make a confession. You may ask already why always analytical solutions. And I always made an excuse that this is to help engineers. But we all know it's a lie, right? Who wants to help engineers here? <laughs> the truth is that a secret goal of every Soviet scientist <laughs> is to find the formula which is elegant enough to be engraved on your tombstone. <laughs> and this looked like a good candidate, finally. <laughs> so model parameters are, again, the shear stress ratio. This parameter car, which depends on our shear stress ratio, R, but this is for the zero velocity. And this growth initiation length, LG, which depends on K, and the characteristic elastic length. <coughs> Condition for basal crack growth. If L is smaller than LG, no fracture growth. L0 is larger than L critical, this initial length. You have instant release. And only in between, you have a delayed failure, and we can calculate now the time of delay, which has two components. The first one between the earthquake and the moment the uh, slip surface starts its slow growth, and the second one, the time which takes it to grow to the critical length and to get a release. We applied uh, this uh, mechanism to delays in Italy and India for a very broad range of parameters for the corresponding slopes 31, 32, and 33 degrees. And for the observed delays, we could always back calculate the initial length L0 of the initial weak zone. And it appeared that they all fall within the um, range between 1 and 50 meters. The problem is that for observed Observed human triggered and avalanches, this length is always between 1 and 5 meters. So there are two questions to ask. Are the existing slopes long enough? Are they longer than 50 meters? The answer is yes, they are. And the second, how can such a long initial fracture form? Well, that's why you need an earthquake. Because uh, the waves or the impact from human triggered avalanches and even from explosions, it's very local. But earthquake waves come with a very wide front and they can cause simultaneous shearing of a pretty wide, uh, wide portion of uh, the snow layer. This also explains why such mild slopes because they require a long initial fracture to fail. Therefore, they need a global trigger. And our model also shows that they have a higher probability of a longer delay. Why only moderate earthquakes? I think we can also explain this. Low magnitude will not create a large L0. It will be lower than LG. There will be no avalanche. <coughs> Strong earthquake will create L0 larger than L critical. You will have immediate avalanche. And only in between, you are going to have a delayed avalanche. And finally, why are these events so rare? Because they require a rare combination of an earthquake during a snowy winter, creating a long initial fracture, which is still shorter than critical. However, maybe there are more of such avalanches than we know, simply 
there are not enough records. Okay? Conclusions. In a rare event after a moderate earthquake, a miles long snow slope can become a ticking time bomb. And unfortunately, I made a mistake. I shared these results with my wife, and this was the end <laughs> of the hot idea. And instead, in April 2018, we bought a holiday apartment on Lake Lucerne. I checked hazard maps. They have never been landslides or avalanches above it. OK? <laughs> And this would be the end of the story. We could have all go now to dinner. But half a year later, my PhD student, Andreas Stocklin, he is here, and myself, were approached by a group of suspiciously looking people. <laughs> Finale, <laughs> tsunamis in Swiss lakes. These people were marine geologists and tsunami research people from Switzerland, Germany, and Austria. They have been investigating a large subaqueous landslide at the bottom of Lake Lucerne, in particular this Vegas landslide. They associated this landslide with a 6.2 magnitude earthquake in 1601, which took place, the epicenter it was about here, so this is about 15 kilometers. There are, there are historical records that uh, the earthquake caused inundations. Well, actually, it caused tsunami wave, okay, with inundations, shore collapse, oscillating water, and so on. However, these people thought that it wasn't the earthquake that caused the tsunami. They thought that earthquake caused the landslide, and the landslide caused the tsunami. So this was a tsunami-genic landslide. They did some uh, calculations, simulations, to show that indeed this landslide could cause a large tsunami. And you see that indeed it is larger than three meters. And 300 seconds after the collapse, a three meter wave arrives to this very important place <laughs> where also the shore collapsed and you already understand why this place is important. So uh, they managed to show that the landslide can cause tsunami but they cannot show using conventional approaches that earthquake of this magnitude can cause such a large landslide. That's why they asked us to help, but they said they, they do not have any money left for research for this problem. And I said, don't worry, we will do this for free. So challenges that we had here, that now we had modeled rigorously all stages of the landslide evolution as a single continuous dynamic process. Starting from preconditioning during sedimentation, to seismic triggering, to slip surface growth, to slab failure, and then to post-failure mass transport. And to be honest, it was too complicated to look for analytical solution. But fortunately, I have a PhD student, Andrea Stocklin, who developed a combined three-step finite element procedure within the Abacus computing environment where we first observe accumulation of shear stresses during fast sedimentation on a slope, then localization of this, sorry, shear strains, a localization of these shear strains during seismic loading, formation and propagation of the slip surface, which leads later to the slab failure and post-failure evolution. We calibrated different parts of this procedure against analytical solution and also observations uh, for submarine landslides uh, offshore Santa Barbara in, in California. But most importantly, we have also validated 
it for St. Nicholas landslide in the Lake Lucerne. And here you can observe post failure simulation with the evolution of the kinetic energy and compare the final runout to the seismic profile for this landslide. And you can see that uh, comparison is not bad at all. But the question is what are the effects of slip surface growth in this case? First of all, they can explain larger landslides, which is already good. But second, it's quite curious that unlike in offshore applications, where the most dangerous thing was when the slip surface grew into the stable zone, causing plowing, this is very dangerous for the wells and the platforms, because you just get sheared at the large depth. Here, for tsunamis, it is more dangerous when we have a run out. We solve also water equations because it appeared it does make a difference for the landslide evolution if you do it dry or uh, submerged in the water. But we cannot propagate tsunami waves because our model is too small. But what we can do, we can provide the mood of boundary of the lake bottom to tsunami researchers and then they can propagate tsunami in the lake. So, conclusions. For the tsunami risk, it is more dangerous when the slip surface cannot grow into a mild slope. And now, as I mentioned, we, may, we work together with geologists and uh, tsunami people to assess future tsunami risks. <laughs> Summary. Slip surfaces can grow both in steep and mild slopes. In steep slopes, the growth is unstable. In mild slopes, it is largely stable. In landslides, this growth affects very large areas, extending damage and elevating pressures far into a mild slope. In a mild and long snow slope subjected to seismic loading, it can lead to a delayed avalanche release. And for landslide triggered tsunamis, it is more dangerous when the slip surface cannot grow into the mild slope. And most importantly, we now know how to quantify all these phenomena. And we arrive to the lessons learned. I hope I convinced you that life is dangerous. Escaping new surgery and going back into geomechanics was not the end of my troubles. Flirting with offshore mafia, living in the landslide influence zone where they hang people, all was searching for analytical solutions and now waiting for a tsunami. But at least it can make a nice story to tell. This is the end. But before we finish, I would like to thank, <laughs> let me do this properly, to thank my collaborators, Itai Inaf, Thierry uh, and Andreas are uh, here today. These are my uh, ex and current PhD students and my colleagues from academia and from industry. Thank you. Thank you. No money for you, sorry. If I'm you okay. Came, if you came here for the money, that's the <laughs> There is uh, this that is uh, oh, this that is we give to you as a sign of our. This is beautiful. And uh, I think we should take a picture. Of this yes. yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for your patience. It's really late. <laughs> thank you. I did it in.